Welcome everyone. I am Paola Corti and I am the Open Education Community Manager at Spark Europe. And uh, today I'm happy to welcome you to the first uh, uh, workshop that uh, the NOL European Network of Open Education Librarians is organizing in 2024. Actually, as you see from the first slide, this is not the first uh, workshop in the series and uh, later on you will uh, see that uh, we have a full playlist of uh, resources connected to this series of workshops and every time we finish any workshop any new workshop we upload all the related resources with the cc by license whenever doable in Zenodo, and the recordings are shared in the devoted playlist on our nol for open youtube channel Today, our workshop is uh, in the Embrace the Open series is devoted to uh, specifically open education librarianship. And we called it one-on-one -on -one because uh, uh, Marta Bustillo, our facilitator, will take you through the first steps that are meant to support uh, you as a librarian, if you are one, or you as a practitioner or an, as an instructional designer also in uh, moving your first steps uh, with open education. Uh, Marta Bustillo is a digital learning librarian at the University College in Dublin. And uh, she works at the library there. And, and uh, she's, she leads the digital uh, literacy uh, team and she's the, an OER advocate. And uh, she also works in the information and the learning service team. So I'm very happy to have you, Marta, today as a facilitator. And I'm here to support you as usually, very informally. Call me if you need me. I'm here behind the scenes, adding links to your uh, to the chat so that people can follow your presentation more thoroughly. Thank you, Marta. Thank you so much, Paola. It's a real pleasure to be here meeting you all. And it's going to be, as Paola says, a very introductory uh, review of open education librarianship. Um, so we will do a little bit of introduction in general about open education. Um, and we'll give you a sense of the criteria that you need to identify OER collections, practical approaches to planning for open educational resources, a little bit of an introduction to Creative Commons li licenses, and I'm hoping we will have towards the end a discussion of the opportunities for the library community um, to contribute to open education. So these are the, the learning outcomes. So after the workshop today, and I stress, it is a very introductory workshop. So you will get a sense of each of these things, but you will probably have to delve deeper in your own time um, to get more of a sense of what open education librarianship is about. Um, but after this workshop, you should have a much better idea about these four things, criteria for selecting OER, practical approaches when you're planning, uh, creative commons licenses, and your role as an open education librarian. Okay, so before we go any further, I would like to get a sense of who you are and what is your involvement with open education, if any. You don't have to have any, um, but um, I'm going to, I think Paola will be putting the link to the answer garden there. Answer garden works best when you do when you use very few keywords. So if you have more than one role or if you want to describe both your level of understanding and your role in open education, please submit a separate entry per thing. Okay? And let me just show you the answer garden if I can. I'm just gonna Escape from here for a minute and go to Answer Garden. Okay. So there's only one question there, or one answer there, which is my own. I am an OER creator, or I hope to be. I aim to be. Um, so let's see.
what you say. Okay. So we have an OER librarian. I am so glad. But you, we also have beginners. I am also very glad. Let's just wait, wait a minute. This will give me a sense of what the level is and what kinds of things you may want to know more about. Let's refresh this again. Excellent. Librarian advocate, OE promoter. No some. Some people are still beginners. Advocates, I want to hear about you advocates, what you do. We'll have a, an opportunity to discuss this later. Okay, so how many of you have re responded so far? Let's just refresh this again. Support and education, beginner facilitator. So a few beginners, a few intermediates, and a few promoters and advocates and even project managers. Excellent. All right. So let me get back to the presentation. I'm just going to stop sharing for a minute because otherwise I find it hard to get to where we are. Okay. Now. Okay, so I, I don't feel too uh, conscious about this being a very introductory uh, introduction because I can see that that's going to be useful. But I also want to hear from you guys who are who have been more involved in open education recently later. So just a, a, a little sort of housekeeping about how this workshop is going to work. There are separate sections to this workshop. And at the end of each section, I'll give you all a minute for asking questions, making comments on the chat, or any kind of comment that you want to make. Just so that we, as well as what I'm talking about, we can get the knowledge of the community from this workshop too. Okay, so just a reminder, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is based on this learning path that we created, is it two years ago now? Something like that, which has really interesting links about open education librarianship. Um, and Paola will be sharing the link to that shortly. Okay. So, what do we mean by open education? It, I think it's very important to remind people that open education goes beyond open access and open source. It's both a way of using digital technologies to widen access to resources, uh, but also a pedagogical approach to creating resources, sharing them, disseminating them, making them easy to edit and more accessible both to students and to educators. I don't know if you know about the five R's of openness, but this is kind of the Bible of, for OER. So open educational resources must have all of these things to be truly considered an OER. So when you get an open educational resource, you should be able to revise it. So adapt it and modify it in any way that you need for your own goals. You should be able to reuse it in a different, in a range of ways. Uh, in presentations, in textbooks, in 
videos, in study groups, websites, whatever. You should also be able to combine this, remix it, so combine it with other resources to create something new. Very importantly, you should retain access to the materials. So I, I know that uh, librarians are very aware of this, that sometimes when you have an ebook, a commercial ebook, uh, students lose access to that ebook once they have finished with that module. Open educational resources are meant to push back against that so that you retain access for good. So you can always keep going back to the resource and reminding yourself of what you've learned. And finally, that you can redistribute copies of the original content, the revisions, the remixes, everything that you create. So these are the, the five R's, revise, reuse, remix, retain, and redistribute. And so just to let you know, the very approach to this workshop, this presentation is as an OER. So everything that we share here we will make it editable, we will share it in such a way that you know the, the credits to all of the images, that the material is has a Creative Commons license so that you can use it and, and share it yourself, and that our own process of creating this workshop is open. So we will also be sharing the workshop plan for, the, for this presentation. I don't know if you want to add anything else to that, Paola. <laughs> no, okay. I think I think it's perfect, Marta. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, let me see. And the other thing that I want to do today is to reflect on where librarians fit into this open education landscape. And there are many potential roles that we can have so, for instance, if you're working in cataloging, you could be a curator of open educational resource collections, make, make them available in your library search interfaces so that your users can access them. You can also be a creator of OER, uh, which is my case, that I'm trying to develop library resources in support of digital literacy, which are as open as possible. And as you will see later, I can't yet completely claim that they are OER, but I am getting there. You can also be a facilitator supporting teaching staff and students uh, or, or your users in general uh, in their own creation and use of OER. And lastly, as we can see from the answer garden, you can also be a, an, a champion, an advocate, become involved with open education policy in your institution, promote it publicly, and contribute to that conversation about open education and open educational resources. But if you have other ideas about roles that librarians can play, let's discuss later. Okay. So let me just... Mm. Something is happening. Okay. We. Okay, let's stop there for a minute. And let me see if you have questions that you want to ask in the chat or whatever. Let's take a look at the chat. Uh, and I wanted to say hello to everyone who has introduced themselves. Uh, it's fantastic to see such a variety of people from different places. And Australia, hello, amazing. <laughs> okay. So if you have questions, if there is anything that you don't understand as I go along, please put it in the chat or simply raise your hand and Paola will point it out to me and just interrupt, you know, this is very informal. Uh, you don't have to worry about asking, okay? So, Criteria to identify high quality OER collections. 
because oh i'm having okay so start at the beginning none of what i'm saying here is rocket science it may Martha, seem obvious yeah Martha, sorry to interrupt you but we are still seeing uh, the librarian's role in open education slide oh really yes oh sorry no worries <laughs> I don't know why this is happening. Okay. Maybe you can just uh, exit and share it, the, yeah. the slideshow and share Let's it again. Stop sharing again. For some reason, it just stopped there. I don't really know why, but let's just don't try worry. this again. It happens. <laughs> uh, okay. Just let's go back there. Share that. Um, okay. okay. Here we are now. Thank you. Excellent. I don't know what happened there. Thank you, Paola. <laughs> okay. So, so you want to create an open educational resource. Now what? That's where I am most of the time when I'm trying to create something for our digital literacy initiative. It helps to actually consider what it is exactly that you want. So what is the topic that you want to cover? What are the learning outcomes of your resource? And more basically, what type of resource do you want to create? Is it going to be an interactive tutorial where, with all kinds of media? Is it just a simple presentation? Is it a document or is it a textbook? Um, who is the author of, of this content? Is it going to be yourself on your own? Or are you going to collaborate with colleagues in the library or with colleagues in your institution or with students? And also, who is the audience? Students, teaching staff, your own library colleagues, the public out there? Where are you going to put it? Is it going to sit in your own institution virtual learning environment, which is behind, uh, well, not quite a paywall, but hidden? Is it going to be a MOOC or a public website? Or are you going to put it in a disciplinary repository? And how will you disseminate it? How you, will you promote it? But also, how will you maintain it into the future? All of these are things that have to be taken into consideration if you want to make your resource an OER. And sitting down to plan this before you even start looking really helps you with focusing on exactly what it is that you need. So, please don't reinvent the wheel. The likelihood is that if you are planning to create a library resource on any topic, somebody else somewhere in the world will probably have thought about it and potentially created uh, an OER. But of course, not all OERs are going to be what you need. Here are some of the criteria that you should consider when thinking about reusing somebody else's creation. And we're going to go through each of these in turn. So the quality of the content, the currency, i.e. is it up to date, the relevance to the audience, and the appropriate rights license. And we will talk about rights in more detail later. What do I mean by the quality of the content? So basically, this is why I asked you first to consider what is it exactly that you want to cover and what the learning outcomes are. Because then when you are reviewing other OERs, you can say, do they address the, my learning outcomes in the way I want to? Do they explain the subject matter clearly? Are the sources that they use high quality scholarly sources? Does it look good or does it look a little bit old fashioned and out of date? 
And finally, how accessible is the content? Now, again, these are not things that I have just thought up. Uh, there are rubrics and criteria that exist out there uh, that you can use to as assess the quality of an OER. And I'm going to try and see if I can click on this one and open it. Oh, I don't know if it's going to let me, but let's see. Paola, can you see the rubric there? No? No, you should uh, click okay, I'm gonna on, just the, go on, for the, on the tab in your browser because we still see the, the slide now. Okay, let's have a look. So in my sharing... By the way, I shared the links meanwhile so people can look at them directly in case they want to go there. Okay. Can you see it now, Paola? Yes, perfectly. Okay, so this is just a sheet where you can jot down the, the OER title, uh, your name and the date. And especially if you're working in a team, it's really good to have something like this, uh, where you can basically grade the OER according to these criteria, interactivity, learning outcomes, accessibility and integration. Is it relevant? to the context of, of your discipline, uh, what is the visual quality, uh, what is the scientific quality, does it have a form of assessment and is it an inclusive type of, type of assessment, does it have a feedback uh, option, all of these things will help you assess the quality of the OER. Okay, and let me go back to the presentation again. Oh, yeah. So those are the rubrics, they are available. We start with the quality of the content because that is the most important thing for any kind of pedagogical approach and open education particularly. It's not the tech or the format that ma matters so much, it's actually the content. It's everything covered in an accessible way. But then you also need to consider other things. OER repositories have been in existence for quite a while now. So there are materials in there that may have been created 10 years ago. The content might be good, but they may look a little bit dated. Or there may be new knowledge that has been discovered since then that negates some of the statements in those OER. So currency is very important. Has it been updated? Uh, and is there a, does the, the resource have a license that allows you to incorporate other knowledge on other resources to make it look a little bit fresher. If not, then you shouldn't go for that OER. And the other thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about is accessibility and relevance to the audience. So obviously you need to select materials that are appropriate for the level of knowledge that you expect from your audience and that are culturally appropriate. And when I say culturally ap appropriate, it doesn't need to be anything complicated, but sometimes there are things that can throw people. And I'll give you an example. Uh, in, some, in most uh, European countries, they use the metric system for measurement, but in other places they may not. They may use an imperial system or, or some other and that might throw people. So you may need to convert measurements or things, simple things like that. But the other thing that I wanted to talk about is open education is very much about inclusion and accessibility. And one of the things that you need to consider both when selecting OER 
made by others and also when you're creating your own is universal design for learning. So your learners are not a kind of monolithic body. They will have their own needs. They may have specific disabilities. They may be of different ages and backgrounds. And so you need to make your materials as accessible as possible. That link there to, to the Universal Design for Learning website in Ireland um, is a really good place to start from. Universal Design for Learning talks about multiple means of engagement, representation, and expression. What does that mean? Now, it sounds complicated, but it really isn't so much. Basically, you need to create resources that have a mixture of text, media, images, etc., so that learners with different styles of learning can get the same kind of engagement with the material. You also need to represent the knowledge that you're trying to communicate with your OER by multiple means again. And Obviously, this is something to do with media and format, but also the language that you use, the colors that you use, the fonts that you use, all those kinds of things are important. And how you, how you uh, allow people to navigate the material. Are you going to let them move back and forth between units? Are you going to create a really strict navigation path? All those kinds of things have to be considered so that you think about who your learners are, what their potential needs may be, and how those needs can be fulfilled. And finally, multiple means of expression. This refers mostly if you are including an assessment in your resource. You need to allow people to submit their assessment in different formats that are more relevant to their own needs, because otherwise you create inequalities that affect your students. So I would really encourage you to think about Universal Design for Learning, to explore the website, to look at how you can make material much more accessible. And then, as I said, make sure that it is appropriate for your level of knowledge. Too simple is as bad as too complex because people will get bored and switch off and not engage with the material. Okay, and then let's talk about the rights license. I'm assuming that many of you will be familiar with uh, Creative Commons licenses. So, we have the concept of copyright, but sometimes copyright is very kind of blanket. It doesn't allow you to specify different potential uses for the material that you create uh, or the OER that you want to reuse. Um, so you need to think about what you need for your own creation and how the license that of this third-party OER that you're looking at allows you to do what you need to do. Do you Are you able to revise the material? Are you able to reuse it? Can you mix it with something else? Do you retain access to it? Can you redistribute it? As I said, further discussion below, but this is key because if you select something made by somebody else, include it into your own um, open educational resource, and then you realize that your own resource cannot be shared in the way that you envisage because of restrictions that are imposed by this third party resource, then you're in trouble. So this is important and we will discuss it soon. Now, Okay, so these are just a few search in search engines that you can use to find OER. 
I'm, use, I'm showing this one first because it is a really great example of a collection of open educational resources in several different languages. Um, like the, the most common one is English and then after that German, but there is Finnish and um, other European languages and some African languages too. So it is really worth exploring. And it functions like any other search engine. You can just put in your keyword at the top and then use the filters on the left-hand side to select the materials that you need. And you can also select by subject and by language. So it's really a good resource. And then of course, the ones that we all know about, OER Commons and Merlot, which have been there for a very long time. And this is why I say, these are great collections. They help you with searching for OER, but you have to be very aware of currency issues because sometimes stuff in there has been there for over 10 years. It hasn't been maintained. The links have become broken. And, and so you need to use that rubric for uh, OER quality to make sure that you're getting what you need. Okay, so that's the end of our first section around using somebody else's OER. And let me have a look at the chat and see if anyone else is making a comment. While you More... look at the chat, I can only add one thing uh, related to Merlot because after COVID, they saw how many people were looking into their resources and they completely renewed the search engine to make it work uh, even better than before. Yeah. So it is more reliable, but I totally agree with uh, the fact that you have to, to be patient with the, some broken links in case you find any or uh, really uh, not updated resources here or there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Maura, uh, you're very welcome. Uh, there are many more of those evaluation tools, so you will be able to find more uh, within the links that we are sharing. Okay. Uh, yeah. So let's continue. Okay. So practical approaches. I have to own up. I'm talking exclusively from my point of view as somebody who is trying to create open educational resources and have, coming up against challenges and barriers. Um, so this is one part of open education librarianship, which is about creating OER. As I said, there are many other roles and we can discuss them later. These practical approaches are about creating stuff. Okay, so let me see. Okay, the first thing I should say is that it is very much within the spirit of open education that OER are created through collaboration. And this has been my experience too, that the more you collaborate, with library colleagues, if you're working in a university, certainly with teaching staff and with students, the more high quality stuff you end up producing. There are massive benefits because especially when you work with students who are themselves interested in the topic, you get an, a much better understanding of the needs of your users. And also, you end up with a much more accessible and inclusive resource because the students will flag issues to do with accessibility, navigability, um, where they feel that the material that you're creating is actually not that easy to follow or that accessible. And of course, if you're collaborating with teaching staff or with library colleagues, then 
you have a much greater level of expertise at your disposal because it's not just you. Um, so I would really stress that nobody can know everything. If you're creating a resource to do with any aspect of library resources, work with the people who are involved with those resources to create something that will stand the test of time. But of course, um, there are challenges to collaborations, particularly if you have a mixed group with librarians and teaching staff and students, because there, are, there can be power imbalances between students and staff that you need to manage very sensitively. And if you don't get a group that gel well together, then the content creation will come to a standstill. So make sure that you give your collaborators all the support and all the training that they need. So for instance, and I'll talk about this in a little while, but I've been working with a group of uh, five students in creating a, a, an online course on digital literacy. And there's been a, an immense amount of time spent on training, talking about pedagogy, talking about the subject in particular, because of course students don't come readily trained. Um, but then sometimes they will teach you something that you knew absolutely nothing about. Um, you also have to make sure that the technology and the software that you will use is accessible for all collaborators. And I'm thinking, for instance, about if you're creating interactive tutorials with the likes of Articulate, Rise, or H5P, you will need licenses for everyone who is going to be creating that content. And that can be a little bit expensive. So think about that. Um, and then finally, when you have a group of people putting together content, you definitely need a competent editor <laughs> because you need someone who will spot the inconsistencies and be able to give the whole thing a unified look, even if there are six or seven different people contributing. Okay. So that's the first aspect of open education. Collaboration is key, but it has to be managed sensitively. Okay, let's go on to the next thing. Two things that may seem obvious, but I'm going to say them anyway. Your institution will have policies about using materials created by third parties. You need to know about these because they will also have policies about their own copyright and how they are prepared to share their own materials. And so if you want to be uh, creating something as a creative commons resource, but your institution doesn't have a policy about that or doesn't allow you to do that, then you need to think about it or lobby uh, your institution's management to let you publish things as, a, as a creative commons. But also, and something I didn't mention directly before, but if you decide that there is a particular OER created by a third party that is really good for what you're trying to do, make sure that you can fulfill the requirements of the rights license, because if the rights license says that they don't allow any derivatives, but you want to remix this material with something else, well, tough, you're not gonna be able to do it. So plan and plan is, I mean, I should just underline that big time. Planning is key. Uh, and also think about what you can do in terms of technology, in terms of proprietary software to share your material, because it might end up that you can't share in the same way that this other OER because you don't have the same resources. So also think about that. 
now. So we've looked at collaboration, we've looked at reusing OER, and let's talk a little bit about content creation tools and dissemination platforms. Now I have to stress, this is a very high level look at this. You will need to read around more to get a better sense of the practical approaches. But first of all, certainly for a, for a university library, uh, sometimes you will be creating materials that you can just put on your website, but sometimes there will be materials that you are putting into your institution's virtual learning environment, which means only your students and your staff will have access to it. But if you really want that resource to be an open educational resource, consider creating two versions of it. One with, with all your university branding and everything else that you put into the VLE, and another one which is branding neutral and that can be shared in a public open platform. I know it doubles the, the amount of work, but once it's done, it ensures that you can share the, the material that you've created. The other thing is, everything that you gather for your resource should be shared for it to be a proper OER. So that means images, media, fonts, colors, you name it, everything possible. And it takes time to gather all of that material and then gather the credit information because another best practice in open education is that you credit everyone for everything that you have used in your resource. So before you start, it, and especially if you're working in a, one of those shared drives, like a Google Drive or something like that, create your folder for media and images and have your text with all of the credit information for your all your images. Trust me, it'll save you so much time. And I'm talking from experience because I don't do it often enough and Paula knows this. <laughs> um, okay, so practical thing, gather all your things in one place and gather all your credit information in one place. The other thing is, depending on what type of resource you're creating, you may end up using proprietary software. In my case, I have created um, interactive tutorials in the software that the library at UCD was licensing, which was in this case, Articulate Rise. That's great for anyone who subscribes to Articulate Rise because you can share the course with anyone around the world. But for those who don't subscribe to Articulate Rice, what do you do? So think about this in advance. Are there other easily editable alternatives, such as a simple text document or a shareable set of slides where you can include all of the material in a format that is easy to update? And when I say this, you're not just creating this for someone else, you're also creating it for yourself. Because what happens when three years down the line, your library gets funding cuts and you can't su subscribe to whatever platform you're using anymore? Do you lose all access to your material? Not if you have created an alternative version. And it can be as simple as a set of Google Slides and a, and a an editable document that has all the main text for your resource. It's a lot easier to update. It's a lot easier to maintain into the future. And you're future proofing it for funding cuts or changes in platform or anything else. You may need to migrate to another platform. And in that case, it'll be easier to have the material in a simple editable format. And then finally, 
appropriate open repositories to publish your materials. So as well as OER Commons and Merlot and OER SI, think about maybe disciplinary repositories where practitioners in that discipline will find it easier to get that material, like Humanities Commons. Or Zenodo is, an, I know, a, a multidisciplinary uh, platform. But whatever you create, try to put it somewhere else that is not within your own institution, just to make it as findable as possible. Okay. And I'm going to talk a little bit about UCD examples. Uh, just to highlight that at the moment, these are in our institutional VLE. Some of the materials for them are available on a website that I'm going to show you in a minute, but it's nowhere near OER. It's just as open as it can be at the moment with the resources that I have at my disposal. And I thought that by sharing the different processes that went into creating these courses, you may find something interesting for yourselves too. So the first one is a course called Exploring Your Digital Identity. All of the courses that I'm creating for UCD's Digital Literacy Initiative are courses that are optional, that don't contribute to the final grade of any student, that don't carry any formal credits. But they are things that they can do to apply for jobs, to apply for certificates within UCD that are to do with co-curricular participation. So this one, Exploring Your Digital Identity, was a three-unit course. I used one existing OER, which was created by the All Aboard team, and it's this one here. But again, I looked at the OER, oops, sorry. I uh, assessed what I needed from it. It was longer than I was hoping, and the images were a little bit dated. So I took the text, but I updated the images and shortened some parts of it. And when I say I, um, I should say we, because I was working with students. And they were brilliant because they were telling me, no, this is too much material to scroll through. I would never read all of these block of text. Let's make it shorter. Let's add an interesting video. Let's add, add a, a, a nice looking image. And it made the resource a lot more easy to navigate for them and more interesting. I did have to create two brand new interactive tutorials, which were created using the words of our students. Okay, so the course is in our VLE. What are the strategies for making materials as open as possible? Well, the obvious one is that I applied a Creative Commons license. Our library has a policy of using CCBYNC, which means non-commercial, and we'll talk about that in a little while. Um, but um, I'm going with our policy. Then, because there was no easy place to share the materials publicly and brand them as UCD library, what did I do? I created a libguide like all librarians do. Uh, and if you click on that link, you will be able to see, you will be able to click on the tutorials and do them, but you will also be able to download the, the files. Now they're not uh, super editable and super shareable because they are articulate rise tutorial files. So some of them have been turned into text or at least branding neutral tutorials so that 
they can be reused without the UCD branding. Um, and of course, the actual outline of the module within our VLE, the exact wording of every unit in the module, the assignment rubrics, etc., have been shared as an editable Word document. Uh, and let me see if I can just go to this and show it to you quickly. So, this is our digital literacy library guide. There's the five hours of openness that I shared earlier. And I have two sections. One, for our own teaching staff to be able to download the SCORM files into the VLE quickly with instructions on how to do it. And then the other one, with a couple of branding neutral literacy tutorials, there will be more going up uh, when I get a chance. And then digital literacy materials as open educational resources. So there's the module plan, there's the rubric, there's some other stuff that I have shared uh, from presentations that I have done, and there will be more things going up. It's not the most exciting looking uh, web page. Uh, it doesn't get an enormous amount of downloads, but at least it's there. And it will be available more widely as soon as I get a little bit of help with it. Uh, let me go back and um, okay. see if I can go back to the presentation. Here we go. Can you see that, Paula? Yep, excellent. Okay. But it, it it's not in uh, slideshow mode yet. <laughs> okay, so let me stop sharing that for a minute and see what's going on. Okay. How about now? Yeah? Uh, it is still um, into the frame of your browser, but it doesn't matter. I think that any... Oh, now it's perfect. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, okay. I should have done it again. Uh, all right. So let's do this again. Slideshow. Okay. How's that? Perfect. Thank you, Martha. Okay, good. So, and then I'm going to talk about another module that I am currently creating. We got funding from the National Forum in Ireland, which is an organization that provides funding for kind of innovative approaches to teaching and learning. Um, and we are creating a five unit module on digital skills for success in the workplace. So again, helping students who are moving into the workplace develop digital literacy skills. I have a team of five students and five academics collaborating and it's exactly the same thing. Uh, we will be whoop, applying a Creative Commons license. It's collaborative content creation with both students and teaching staff. Um, but this time the materials will be shared on the National Forums repository. They're not available yet, but they will be. Um, and this time, because we were working with students who were incredibly talented and able to create easily accessible material, we now will have the text scripts and audio for all the five tutorials, plus the module outline and the rubrics for the assessment and everything else available in editable documents and PDF formats for good screen readers and all that kind of thing. I can't claim they are OER yet because the tutorials are still created in articulate store, uh, articulate rise. And so the files are relatively difficult to edit, but we do what we can. And when we get an opportunity for opening up more, then you open up more. Okay, so now I'm going to Stop sharing for a minute. And I want to ask you, 
about practical approaches, approaches that you use to make your materials OER, or at least as open as possible. And I'm aware that some of you are not in a position to speak, so please share examples in the chat or just talk about them. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing now and see what you have to say. Do any of you have resources that you're creating or examples of things that you have worked in the past um, that you may want to share with your colleagues? Okay, let's see. I'm going to look at the chat. Let me break the ice here. <laughs> yes. With, uh... Uh, an example as a practitioner and not uh, related directly to the European network of open education librarians, because uh, uh, you might know that I also work at Politecnico di Milano. And again, following your lead, Marta, I, I couldn't stress more that you do what you can with what you have, where you are, and the resources that uh, are at your disposal at the present time. So that's what we try to do with uh, MOOCs. Actually, this is our, I wouldn't say small because it's big. We have more than 100 MOOCs and most of them starting 2016 are openly licensed. But of course, it's not the perfect, you know, uh, way to share resources. So it's good enough, <laughs> as we used to say, when you have no other uh, opportunities. And uh, I can share the link in the chat if anyone is interested. We are experimenting now. Uh, with our first experience of a MOOC that was uh, that uh, we started designing from the very from moment zero in order to make it reusable at the highest level by anyone. So I will keep you posted on this one. Okay, and Linda says that in Sweden they have the same learning management, so Brightspace, Canvas, whatever, and there is a Commons part. We don't yet have that in Ireland, I don't believe, but I think we may be moving in that direction. And I, I get it, yes, it's a great way of sharing material with others, but with others within the education system. Uh, if you want to share something that, say, secondary school teachers can use, then you want to make it even more open. Um, but as Paola says, uh, oh, and look at that. And Denmark Learning Lib Platform. So later we are going to ask you to um, put your favorite open educational resources into a Padlet. So if you don't mind sharing those links in the Padlet later, that would be fantastic. And Camilla. Yes, all, every, all materials available in the internal system and Moodle also, of course. For me, that's the next step. You can share it within uh, educational institutions, but ultimately University College Dublin is a public university. We are funded with public taxes. And so I want my material to be available for anyone who wants to do it uh, or use it or reuse it. Okay. So let's get back to where we were. And let me see. Your turn. Okay. So let's get a little bit into the rights discussion because I know that this one is one of the stumbling blocks for people. Okay, so this is a summary of the different types of CC license. It comes from a really good resource called the OER Toolkit, which was created by the libraries of the universities of Leeds, Sheffield and York. They're called the White Rose Libraries. And I think it's a, it's a really good summary. So basically, a Creative Commons license has, has 
four different elements. The attribution, the sharing, and the derivatives, and whether you want commercial or non-commercial use of your materials. So if we go from the top, from left to right, the freest Creative Commons license is this one, CCBY. And all this license asks you to do is that you attribute the material that you have uh, taken. So it's basically reference your sources. The second one is attributions share alike, which means that you can only use this material if you are prepared to share in exactly the same way as the original OER. The third one is a little bit more restrictive. It's asking you to attribute the material to sh and to only use it for non-commercial purposes. Now, I know that many of us are fed up with corporations and we don't want people to be able to profit from our free labor, but I also want you to consider something, which is if you wanted to use this material on a, say for instance, a WordPress website, strictly speaking, WordPress is a commercial uh, organization. So if you put a non-commercial license to your OER, then it won't be usable within a WordPress platform. So that's something to think about. I'm not saying there, there is a right or wrong answer here. And as I explained before, at UCD library, we do apply a non-commercial license, but that's the caveat. That sometimes if you're creating a, a Google site or a WordPress or whatever, these are sites that you create for the projects and educational resources that you're creating, but they do have a commercial component. Okay, so then you have number four, the left at the at the bottom, um, attribution, non-commercial and share alike. So if you want to reuse an OER with this license, you have to be able to share it in the same way as this per the original material and it has to be non-commercial. And then the last two are the most restrictive. Uh, oh. Non-derivatives, CCBY, but ND, which means you can't remix it, you can't create another version, you have to use the thing as is. And then the final one, it's also non-commercial and non-derivative. So you just have to use the work without any adaptations. Okay, so the right license makes all the difference because if you choose an OER which has CCBY and CND, there isn't a lot that you can do with it. If you apply CCBY and CND to your own material, there is very little that other people can do with it. Or in some jurisdictions, you can apply public domain to the material that you create. So public domain works are either works that have gone out of copyright um, or where copyright was not enforceable in the first place. But in some jurisdictions, you can create something and make it CC0 so that it goes specifically into the public domain immediately. And I'm going to ask Paola to talk a little bit about this because I understand that this is not doable in all jurisdictions. Yeah, uh, thank you, Marta. That's something that I discovered uh, while, I mean, I'm 
as we used to say in the open education world, I'm not a, a lawyer, you know, so I'm also studying all the time and I discover new things related to the legal codes behind the licenses in time while practicing, as Marta said. And uh, one thing that uh, we discovered the, um, something like four years ago is that, uh, of course, there are differences in different jurisdictions. In our Italian law, we have we don't have a copyright law. We have an author's right law, which is slightly different. And, for example, if I create a resource and I'm the author of that resource, uh, my creative work is a... Uh, compelled to be attributed correctly. Or, I mean, I can't choose not to be recognized as an author, okay? So mm -hmm. theoretically, I can choose to release a resource with a CC0 license, but I don't know who, but someone might sue me because I'm not compliant with my author's right law in Italy, okay? I so see. attribution for us is mandatory. Okay. So, uh, so as I say, in some places you will be able to apply CC0, in others you won't. And let me just get back to this. Okay, and finally, if you are reusing somebody else's OER, there are recommended best practices for attribution. And the acronym is TASL which stands for title, author, source, and license. And this is an example. So this is an image of a tassel. Uh, because it's a late 17th century tassel, we don't actually know who the author of the material is. So we don't need to use the A for author. Uh, but we do need know that the source is the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum and that the license is public domain. And just to make sure, I'm putting in the link there so that anyone who wants to download the, this image file can. At the bottom there is a, a, the Creative Commons Wiki with recommended practices for attribution, where they give different examples of how to attribute different types of materials. So images and videos and text and whatever, uh, which is a really good thing to use. Okay, and finally, we get to our discussion point. And let me go back to the roles that I listed before. So obviously, if you are in working in an academic library and you are working in cataloging, one of the good things that you can do to promote OER is simply include them in library search interfaces. And I realize that sometimes the search interfaces are not easily uh, manipulable by individual librarians, but you can negotiate with providers of search interfaces to incorporate these kinds of collections. You can also be a creator or a facilitator or a champion, but are there any others? So let's have a quick discussion. And to get started with the discussion, let me show you these questions. Are there, oh, sorry, open education initiatives in your own institution? And if so, how are librarians in involved? What are the obstacles? And what are the opportunities? Okay, so just to say, in UCD, apart from my efforts at creating open educational resources uh, for the Digital Literacy Initiative, there are pockets in the university where units are creating open educational resources in a very low key way, but there is no institutional wide policy on creating open educational resources or on open education in general. And that is a real problem because until there is backing from the university for these kinds of initiatives, 
it's actually much more difficult to create stuff. So I'm going to stop sharing. If you can talk, please talk. If you can't, just put your thoughts uh, in the chat. So let me know what's happening in your universities. Uh, do you have an open education unit within the library? Or are you involved in national uh, initiatives on open education? Or do you need help? What's happening? Okay, Holly. Okay, so I'm, I'm just seeing Holly's comment on Creative Commons. Yes. The importance of attribution be beyond the six CC license tools. Anyone else? Anything to say? So Linda, do you have do you actually have a a specific policy that says that your resources should be CCBY? Okay. No actual policy, but you just aim to, to have it that way. Because even though when Paola introduced me, it says that I am the lead on open education, it's basically I'm really starting. Like it's not something that I have been doing for a long time. So eventually I hope that there will be some kind of a policy. Okay, Mora. that your intellectual property policy is not very open friendly. I think that happens in a lot of organizations. Um, I mean, at University College Dublin, we have seen a change because of uh, European requirements for open data. So there, there is a requirement for data and kind of scholarly publications to be made available open access. But open access is one thing and open education is a different one. And because there's such emphasis on research and a lot less emphasis on teaching and learning, open education kind of gets left behind, I think. I think we had something similar at the VU in Amsterdam. So there is a, there is a, um, I don't think there's an actual active policy, definitely not towards uh, open educational resources, but there is a strategic ambition to, uh, to have 100% uh, open access publications by mm -hmm. I think 2030 or something. Um, but yeah, the, I think it's the same as with you at UCD that there are like in like pockets where there are people working on open educational resources. We do have a center for teaching and learning where there is, uh, uh, mm. we are working towards open education and they are very closely affiliated with a university library. Uh, so we have uh, sort of ideas and we do, I think our best to, uh, yeah, to, um, to raise awareness among teachers for, uh, and to uh, and to advocate for the use of open education sources uh, if they are available. In in my experience, and I know what. Please don't roll your eyes at me, but <laughs> our university is starting the strategic planning cycle again, and sometimes that makes a difference because they need content for their strategy. And if what you are promoting kind of chimes in with some aspects of the strategy, and especially at UCD, because there's so much emphasis on uh, sustainable development goals and all of that, you can kind of 
take advantage of that. It happened with digital literacy. Um, I mean, the reason why I am the digital learning librarian is that digital literacy was specifically name checked in our previous strategy. So something needed to be done about it. Um, and so, and I think there are resources out there for kind of nudging the, the policy makers towards open education, which maybe we should share, Paola, I might add something to the presentation. Um, but again, it's it, it can be hit and miss and you have to make an effort to identify the people who at university level might move this forward. Our Center for Teaching and Learning actually has a small repository in OER Commons where they share their own stuff. But it is, as I say, a small, unconnected kind of set of efforts. And maybe that needs to change. And maybe I'm the one who needs to change it. You never know. Okay. Anyone else has any comments on this? May I add uh, a comment on this if no one else is uh, raising their hands so far? Um, I think that sometimes a lack of policy at the very beginning of your open education journey can be um, past the term a bless because you have uh, some freedom to pilot test your uh, ideas, uh, see what works, uh, learn from your mistakes and then come up with ideas to be ready so as to have them in the moment you are now marta you know when yes, a new absolutely. strategy is being drafted you have something that you can contribute uh, and uh, you might have that chance there to make something be embedded in the policies otherwise also uh talking from experience, but also from the experience of many other practitioners, at least you have your small room to test and to learn, okay? Yeah. And then when the institution ready is ready or when the chance comes, you are ready to. So- Yeah, I totally agree, Paola. And I think there is a freedom to that space where things are about to, to move. Um, and I think that's where maybe open education librarians can move into that space and start doing interesting things in a very low key way, but moving things forwards. And thank you, uh, Linda and Monique for your comments. I, I do agree, Linda, that there is a certain uncertainty about the CC licenses. And sometimes you have to take the approach of asking for forgiveness rather than permission and just choose a license and move with it. And sometimes what happens is that you choose a license and everybody thinks, great, that's a good one. Let's choose that one. So, okay. And Monique, thank you for that. That's brilliant. Great to have that resource added. Okay, and James, thank you for being here. So, we're now seven minutes from the end, so I want to give Paola a chance to talk about what's coming in our inaugural workshops. So I'm going to share again. You also um, wanted to ask uh, people to add something to the Padlet, Marta, maybe. Yes, just, of course, of course. Okay. before I... <laughs> yes, okay, so let me uh, do a new share. Do I have, okay, just give me a second. No worries, I added the, the link to the Padlet uh, in the oh. chat. Okay, excellent. I just want to actually get to it, uh, if I can. Yes, okay, here we go. So, here is our Padlet, and Paola has shared the, the link there. I just uh, shared three 
resources on using OER and open education, or, or rather two resources on using OER and open education, and then one that was created by uh, the librarian at the education and training boards in Ireland, which is not higher education, but further education. And they created a sets of books for trades to do with maths and other things. It's an amazing resource. Um, and I thought we should promote it because <laughs> it's made in Ireland by a, a well-known colleague. So if you have resources, oh, sorry, I should move back to the Padlet. So if you have resources that you have created in your own institution that are either OER on any discipline or actually a resource to help librarians and other people get into open education and understand the tenets of open education, then please put them on the Padlet because then the Padlet can be shared with other colleagues and you get all the links in one place. Let's see if anybody else has added anything. Nothing so far. We'll leave the Padlet open. And in the meantime, oh, brilliant. Something from the Netherlands, fabulous. If you have search indexes or, or, or search engines about open educational resources, that's also brilliant too. Okay, and Paola, <laughs> I'll leave Thank the next you. word to you. Thank you, Marta. Thank you for ah. everything that that you that you shared with us today, and for your welcoming approach, which is always something that amazes me. I love your way of presenting. So, if you're curious to know more, since uh, Marta's webinar was uh, workshop, sorry, was really meant to be an introduction and uh, let's say. Um, um, bird eye view on some of the main challenges and benefits for librarians when they engage with open education and creating open educational resources and be willing to share them. You know, we can dive deeper into this and uh, the NOL members are happy to share their expertise so far with the larger community in the um, in the next workshops that we are planning to have in March and April mainly. So starting with the first one, and we are defining the exact date this week. Tomorrow we have a meeting about that. So follow us on uh, uh, the social media and we are happy to share it, the, the, the new dates with you whenever. If you let us uh, um, reach you by email, uh, so just reach out to me if you want to. So we have a new coming uh, um, a series of four webinars. Paola, searching you've... for and finding we are in during the Open Education Week. Um, sorry? Um, you just froze there. It, mi it might have been my coverage. I don't really know. Okay, no problem. No problem, Martha. Yeah, so I was saying that uh, we have a, a, a series of uh, four uh, upcoming workshops. Uh, diving into the details more deeply. So the first one is searching for and finding OER during the OER, the Open Education Week at the beginning of March, and uh, the date will be decided tomorrow. Then we have another one focusing on reusing and creating OER on March 19th. The idea of having those workshops so close to each other is that we don't want you to have to go back to the previous recorded version or the previous shared materials, because they will be fresh in your mind if you want to join us for all the, the whole series. Then we are going to have another one on sharing OER, either on two, uh, Thursday 11 or Friday 12 April. And uh, the last one in this short uh, series will be uh, OER as open education pedagogies on the 6th of May. 
Then the series of workshop will continue. So uh, count on us to accompany you in your open education journey till the end of this year and beyond. But uh, the new titles and uh, the new dates will be shared along during the year, let's say. So this first set of webinars is really meant to help you uh, get, um, get involved, start creating, start sharing more openly and more widely, and uh, build your uh, basic skills on how to do that um, with our librarians in the room. So I'm happy okay. that you at this opportunity because our librarians in the NOL are great at sharing. Okay. Paula, am I missing a, a slide? The, wasn't there one uh, where people could put in the their email addresses? Uh, well, uh, the thing is that, uh, uh, no, it's not there because uh, we have the, the email here and people already agreed when registering to this webinar whether they want us to update them or not. Oh, so okay. in case anyone didn't uh, mm, complete that part and want to reach out and be uh, updated, I'm happy to do that anyway. So write me an email to this oer at sparkeurope.org uh, email or at my personal email, paola.corti at sparkeurope.org. Okay. Thank you again, Marta. Thank you. <laughs> Well, we've reached the end of um, this workshop. I hope it was a good introduction. As Paola said, the next um, webinars will go more deeply into each of the sections of this um, webinar. And we look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you so much.